this lecture, lecture 37 of our series on numerical methods in civil engineering, we will continue our discussion on using orthogonal basis functions for solving partial differential equations. To recapitulate, we recall that we are interested in solving the general linear problem where L is a linear operator, L operating on u is equal to f where f is a known function in a certain domain d. So, we are interested in finding that u which satisfies that equation subject to certain boundary conditions, boundary conditions defined on the domain on the domain boundary which we denote as del d. So, on the boundary L bar u, L bar u is equal to g. So, on the boundary u, L bar is the boundary condition. So, L bar operating on u is, is an operator which defines the boundary condition. So, L bar operating on u is equal to g on the boundary. So, we are sol interested in solving this problem and we want to use orthogonal basis functions for solving these problems and this L is typically a differential operator and since we are interested in solving real world problems in multi dimensions, it is usually a partial differential or it is an operator, a differential operator which involves partial derivatives. right? And actually we actually we in order to solve this problem, we actually solve two problems. We divide this problem into two parts and we solve two parts the problem has part B. So, the problem A has part B and part C. On part part B, it involves solving the problem L u 1 is equal to f in D and L bar u 1 is equal to 0 on del D and part B involves solving the problem L u 2 is equal to 0 in D and L bar u 2 is equal to g on del D. So, you can see that is divided into two parts. In the first part of the problem, we satisfy, we, we, satis we, we, we divide the solution into two parts, u is equal to u 1 plus u 2 and in the first part, we solve the, we solve the problem L u 1 equal to f in d and L bar u 1 is equal to 0 on del d. So, in the first part, in within the domain, it satisfies L u 1 equal to f. So, it satisfies the, the actual equation L u equal to f within the domain, but on the boundary, it satisfies the boundary condition in a homogeneous fashion. So, L bar u 1 is equal to 0 in del d. In the second part of the problem, L u 2 is equal to 0 in d and L bar u 2 is equal to g on del d. So, within the domain, it satisfies the, the differential operator in homogeneous manner and on the boundary, it satisfies the exact boundary condition. And we can divide this problem, our original problem A into two parts B and C, solve them separately and then use those, add those two solutions u 1 and u 2 together and claim that u 1 plus u 2 actually satisfies my original system A because of the fact that my operator L is a linear operator, right? Because it is a linear operator, only because of that we can use this approach. Divide, it, divide the solution into two parts. One part satisfies the actual differential equation and the boundary condition homogeneously. The other part satisfies the differential equation in the domain, not the actual differential equation, but the homogeneous part of the differential equation in the domain but has the actual boundary conditions, which satisfies the actual boundary conditions. So, we get the two solutions, we add them together and we get our final solution. And we saw earlier on that in our last lecture that if we can solve the problem B, it is very easy to find the solution C. So, we, we basically focus our efforts on solving the problem B. Basically, instead of solving the problem L u equal to f in d and L bar u is equal to g on del d, we solve the, the same problem, but with homogeneous boundary conditions L u is equal to f in d, L bar u 1 is equal to 0 on del d. This part we can easily solve. And we also saw that if the operator is self adjoint and we explained what is a self adjoint operator, L u the inner product of L u with v is equal to u in a product of u with l v, right. So, that is a self adjoint operator. So, if the operator is self adjoint, 
then it has the very nice property that its eigenfunctions form an orthogonal basis for the solution space of L u is equal to f subject to very general boundary conditions. Right? So, if L is a self adjoint operator, its eigenfunctions form a orthonormal basis. Right? And since it form, they form an orthonormal basis, it is possible to express any solution u to this system B in terms of in terms of a linear combination of those basis functions. Right? We have talked about these things in our earlier lectures. This is just to recap recapitulate. Any solution can therefore be expressed as a linear combination of the eigenfunctions. That means that if we have if we know the eigenfunctions of the operator L, if we have if we know the solution of the problem, the eigenvalue problem recall is given by L u is equal to lambda u or L u equal to, and so if we can solve if we know the solution of that I of that problem, if we know those eigenfunctions and since it is a self adjoint operator L is a self adjoint operator, we know that, that those eigenfunctions form an orthonormal basis then any solution u tilde can be expressed as a linear combination of those basis functions of those eigenfunctions right those eigenfunctions now form a basis right they form a basis for the function space right and so psi 1 psi 2 psi n are my n independent basis functions and c1 c2 through cn are arbitrary constants so any solution to u to that equation L u is equal to f in d and L bar u 1 is equal to 0 on del d can be expressed as in this form. So, now the, our, our, basic, our basic problem is to solve L u tilde is equal to f where we know that u tilde is of this form and we have to satisfy and in, if, if, if this u tilde is truly a solution then we know that this condition has to be satisfied. Right? since u tilde is a solution we just substitute u tilde here. So, we get c 1 l psi 1 plus c 2 l psi 2 through c n l psi n and that must be at least close enough it must in order to satisfy the equation in a reasonable manner it must be very close to the given function f right. How close determines the accuracy of the solution and the criteria we use to enforce the condition that f is indeed approximately equal to c y sigma i equal to n to 1 to n c i l psi i determines the solution method. So, there are many many ways in which we can enforce that condition that this minus f in some norm is very very small. If that if this thing this left hand side minus f norm of that in some norm is very very small then we know that our solution u tilde is our solution approximate solution u tilde is a is an acceptable solution to my system right and the way we enforce that criterion that condition determines the solution method so one method which we have already talked about earlier is the least squares minimization method so we basically say that i want to calculate the norm of this f minus sigma i equal to 1 to n c i l psi i. I will calculate the norm of this Maybe I will just calculate the norm using the L 2 norm right and take the inner product right and make sure that the, the square root of the inner product that is a minimum right. So, that, that, that condition can be used and that leads to this requirement. We have seen that earlier also it leads to the requirement that this inner product L psi j must be equal to 0 for all psi j, j is equal to 1 through n right. For this to be a minimum, for this to be a minimum, for this norm to be a minimum, it must satisfy this condition and we saw last time that leads, this leads to a system of equations for the, co for the coefficients c. If we solve, to the, solve that system of equations we can find the c's and once we find the c's we can construct our solution u tilde is equal to c 1 psi 1 like this right. So, that is using least squares minimization. So, unlike the least squares minimization technique and the collocation method which we also talked about briefly 
there is another method which is known as the Galerkin method and that uses a different criteria. Recall I said that there are different methods for, for finding this solution just depend on the criteria we use to enforce the condition right to enforce this condition that f is approximately equal to this right. So, the criteria is changing. So, for the least squares minimization method this was the criteria that this has to be a minimum. In the Galerkin method we say that this this if you can think of this as the residual function the f minus sigma i equal to 1 to n c i l psi i that is the residual that is the part by which my approximate solution which I use which I construct like this does not match my given function that is the residual. The residual is orthogonal to each and every member of this of this space h m. Recall the space h m the psi's are the basis functions for the space h m. So, this residual I have to make it orthogonal to each and every member of that space h n right. So, this is basically this if we if I use this criteria instead of that criteria I have the Galerkin method while if I use this criteria I am using least squares minimization. So, the difference in this criteria it is subtle, but it is very very important the only difference that you will notice between this and that is that here I am making it orthogonal to each and every L psi j right. While in the Galerkin method I am, in, I am enforcing I am requiring that the residual be orthogonal to each and every basis function of my function space h n right that is the fundamental difference. So, the comparison of these two equations reveals the difference between the Galerkin and the least squares method. In the least squares method the residual is required to be orthogonal to each and every linearly dependent independent component of the best approximation to f that is it has to be orthogonal to each and every l psi j while in case of the Galerkin method the residual function has to be orthogonal to each and every basis function psi j. So, that is the fundamental difference. Now, if we assume that L is self adjoint as well as positive definite, a new norm and associated inner product can be defined on the function space H n. So, instead of using my L 2 norm, I can define a new norm and that new norm I can define a n number of norms. We have discussed norms earlier on, we have our L 2 norm, we have the maximum norm, we have so many different norms right. So, this we define another norm like this and this norm I did I denote by this sort of brackets right u v u is a is 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 maybe is function u and v is another function v. So, I define the inner product of u and v as u l v inner product of u with l v this is my conventional inner product and this new inner product I defined as u v is equal to u l v and this automatically gives rise to a norm because u u is equal to u l u and that is norm of u square. So, now this the no, this this gives a gives a norm which is somewhat different from my usual l 2 norm which I get from my inner product because here I am taking not just the inner product of the function with itself I am taking the inner product of the function with l u right. So, this inner product is distinct from the inner product associated with the L 2 norm is defined with respect to the operator L. So, this inner product actually depends on the operator right it depends on the operator it is defined with respect to the operator. So, that is a norm and if L is positive definite and u star is the solution is the exact solution to B that is L u star is equal to f on D and L bar u star is equal to 0 on D, if we can show that the Galerkin method has some very 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 useful properties. And what is that property? The Galerkin method gives the best possible approximation to u star in the function space H n measured in this norm. That is that basically explains the popularity of the Galerkin method, because we are guaranteed that given 
given this norm, given that we can define this norm, the Galerkin method gives the best possible, the best possible approximation to the true solution. This, this u star is my true solution. If I solve this problem using the Galerkin method, that whatever u I get from solving the Galerkin method, that is going to give me the best possible approximation to u star measured in this norm, right? Not measured in the usual norm, usual norm, but measured in the norm which is defined with respect to the operator L. That basically contributes to the popularity of the Galerkin method, and as we will discuss later, it also contributes to the popularity of methods such as the finite element method, which are basically Galerkin methods. So, from the solution of the error minimization problem, the best possible solution u in H n in the u norm must satisfy the requirement that u minus u star v now defined with respect to this, this product must be 0 for each and every v belonging to H n. Right? This is the difference, this is the, this is the Galerkin solution, u star is the true solution u minus u star is the error, right? The true solution, the Galerkin solution minus u star, that is the error. The error the, with the inner product, with uh, which you take the product with each and every v, for because each and every v belonging to H n, I know that it is linearly independent and this must be equal to 0, right? So, what does this mean? This, this means that v u minus u star is equal to, th then we can translate it in terms of our usual inner product that becomes v l u minus u star, right? Because this inner, this inner product is defined with respect to l. So, v l u minus u star and then taking advantage of the linearity of the operator, we can write it as v l u minus v l u star, right? We can write it as v l u minus v l u star that is v l u and l u star I know is the exact solution. So, l u star must be equal to f. So, v l u minus f. So, what does it mean? It means that require requiring this to be equal to 0 is equivalent to requiring v l u minus f is equal to 0. Right? If I want, if I said, if I require this to be equal to 0, that means that this has got to be equal to 0. However, I know that this is actually my Galerkin condition. My Galerkin condition is exactly that, right? That the residual must be orthogonal to each and every basis function of the space H n. So, finding the best possible solution u belonging to H n in this norm is equivalent to finding the solution using the Galerkin method, right? So, finding the best possible solution in this norm is equivalent to finding the solution using the Galerkin method. So, what does it mean? It means that the Galerkin solution always gives me the best possible solution in this norm, stating it is the converse of that. That means that if I find the solution using the Galerkin method, I am automatically finding the best possible solution in this norm right because this is equivalent to that so finding the solution using the galerkin method whatever solution i find gives me the best possible solution in this norm right so if i minimize this right if i minimize this and find the best possible solution with for this then i am also solving the galerkin problem So, it, it can be shown that the best approximation of the Galerkin method, which is another uh, ramification of that, the best approximation of the Galerkin method also ensures that it minimizes this functional u a u minus 2 f u, where a is any, uh, any operator, any linear operator, which is self adjoint, right. If I can write a functional like this u comma a u minus 2 f u, then I can it can be shown 
that the best approximation property of the Galerkin method ensures that this functional is also minimized provided that this functional u a u minus 2 f u can be written in this form provided this functional can be written in this form and we I, I am going to just show that it is indeed possible for our assumptions for the assumptions that we made that a is a linear operator that a is self adjoint that it is possible to write this in this form this functional in this form. How are we going to show it? Let us look here. So, u minus u star in a product of u minus u star that with itself u minus u star defined in this norm right. This is equal to again because of the definition of this norm that is the inner product the u usual inner product, but now with u minus u star and a u minus a u star that is the definition of this product right. So, this can be written like this then again taking advantage of the linearity of the operators we can write it like this u a u minus u a u star minus u star a u plus u star a u star this remains the same u a u star becomes u in a product f because u star is the exact solution. So, u in a product f minus a u star u here we are using the fact that the operator is self adjoint right. So, u star a u is equal to a u star u similar and here again we have u star a u. So, pulling all these terms together and take again using the fact that a u star is equal to f. So, we have u f minus f u and since the, this since the order does not matter in this inner product we can write it as u comma a u minus twice f comma u plus u star u star in this in the inner product of u star u star using this new inner product right. So, we can write it like this. This is actually establishes equivalence because if u is equal to u star what happens u is equal to u star then this thing is going to be minimized right because this thing is u comma a u minus twice f u is equal to this minus that right. If this becomes 0 say right that is the minimum possible value for this part right that then it becomes if that is the minimum possible value for u a u minus twice f u. So, thus if u is equal to u star u a u minus twice f u is minimized among all functions u for which the functional u a u minus twice f 2 times f u in a product f with u exists. Since the Galerkin method gives the best approximation to u star in this norm in this norm that means it also minimizes this functional it also minimizes that function. This has got very important ramifications in mechanics why because in many mechanics problems there are, there exists what are known as variational principles. So, what these what do these variational principles do they say that if you can set up a potential which is some measure of the energy it is an it is a function it is an energy functional right it is an energy functional and if you minimize that potential the solution that you get is it you are going to recover the governing equations of that problem. So, if, if, you are, if you are solving a mechanical system and you are interested in finding the equations of motion the governing equations which define that system the one way to set up to get those governing equations is to write an expression for the energy for the energy functional for the energy in that system for the energy potential of that system. And then if you set the first variation of that to, to 0 it is possible to come up with to uh, arrive at the equilibrium equations of that system. So, this is known as the variational method and what we are so showing here is that for self adjoint problems the solution to the variational method the variational method which basically involves minimizing this functional 
u a u minus twice f u if that functional represents the energy of the system represents a potential energy potential of that system then minimizing that functional that functional is equivalent to solving the galerkin problem it is equivalent to solving the galerkin problem right so what does this mean that for self adjoint linear operators the galerkin method is actually going to give you it can be regarded as a variational method because it is going to give exactly the same solution as as the variational method which involves minimizing this potential right which involves minimizing this potential however it is important to emphasize that the galerkin method is much more it's much broader it is much more powerful than the variational method because there are many classes of problems for which it is not possible to write down an energy potential like this and then minimize that and come up with the governing equations for instance for non conservative systems it is not that simple right it is not possible to write that but for conservative systems it is possible to do that but for conservative systems it means that the galerkin method and the variational method are going to give identical solutions the galerkin method can be thought of as a variational method in such a case but for for other problems for which it is not possible to write down a potential energy potential like this it is not the galerkin method can still be used while the variational method cannot be used the simple variational method cannot be used straight away right so th that th that is that 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 is why the galerkin method is much more in in a sense it's much more general it is a much more general method but but for the simple case that is when we have linear self adjoint when we have self adjoint operators l then it is possible to do so right the, to establish equivalence between these two methods the galerkin method is also an instance of a broader class of methods known as weighted residual methods recall in the galerkin method what did we say we say that f minus this residual has to be orthogonal to each and every psi j right it has to be orthogonal to each and every ba every basis function of that function space hn but if there is a broad broader the galerkin methods are a particular instance of a broader class of methods known as weighted met residual methods in this weighted residual methods we do not require this to be orthogonal to the same function space to the basis functions of the same function space but they can be we, they can be the, it requires orthogonality with some set of basis functions but those basis functions can belong to a totally different space right in the for 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 the class of weighted residual methods the red, the residual f minus sigma i equal to 1 to n c i l psi i is required to be orthogonal to the function space h prime m which need not be as necessarily the same as the function space h n spanned by this i j. So, I am constructing my approximate solution using basis functions psi which belong to the function space h n right, but when I am requiring orthogonality I am saying that it is this residual is orthogonal to the basis functions of maybe another function space h prime m right so that's why galerkin weighted residual methods are more general but the galerkin method requires that it be orthogonal to the basis functions belonging to the same function space hn if the function space h prime n is spanned by orthogonal basis functions psi prime j j is equal to 1 to m this imposes the criteria that the residual be orthogonal to the basis functions of that function space where psi prime j belongs to h prime m psi prime j does not anymore span h n right it belongs to it spans h prime m so this is the weighted residual method this is the galerkin method you can see is is a specialization of the weighted residual method it only says that it says that no a psi prime j cannot belong to any arbitrary space 
it has to belong to the same space from which you construct your trial solution from which you construct your trial solution C i psi j. The finite element method is actually a weighted residual method and there are two main variations of the finite element method the Galerkin finite element method and the Petrov Galerkin finite element method both are weighted residual methods in the Galerkin finite element method the spaces H n and H prime n are one and the same because we just saw that the Galerkin finite element method requires that those two base spaces must be the same. But on the other hand the Petrov Galerkin finite element method says that those function spaces H n and H prime n need not be the same that is the basis function psi j and psi prime j are not the same. And so, th so that is the finite element method is basically a Galerkin method or a Petrov Galerkin method, but it is not just any, but, but the, you, why, why, the reason why finite element methods are so popular is because the basis functions that, that are used in these finite element methods are really, really very, very simple functions and they are, spe they are specialized to solve particular problems and they can be specialized to solve different types of problems, but they are basically very simple functions, very simple polynomials right? and they have very nice properties which makes the finite element method that popular and it is simple to use it can be solved used to solve a wide variety of problems. So, chief so, so the Galer so the finite element method requires that these basis functions possess something known as local support. What do we mean by local support? Recall that in the collocation method which we discussed in the previous class we require the impose the requirement on the basis functions that the basis functions are evaluated only at the grid points. Right? This allows each basis function to be associated with a particular grid point. Thus, a basis function basically be each basis function is like a Dirac delta function. It is 1 at a particular grid uh, basis function associated with a particular grid point j is 1 at that grid point j, but it is 0 at every other grid point. So, that those are those are the Dirac delta functions which are used which are which are the basis functions of the collocation method. So, in the finite element method the basis functions are slightly more general they say that no the basis functions are not just Dirac delta functions they are not not 0 everywhere else and only one at a particular grid point with which it is associated, but they have local support. What do we mean by local support? It basically means something like this it basically means that my basis functions are they, they have a maximum at a grid point the basis function phi 2 is associated with the grid point 2 it has a maximum value at that, that grid point, but then it linearly decreases as we move away from the grid point and by the time we reach another grid point a neighboring grid point to grid point 2 the basis function has become 0. Right? So, it has got local support, it is locally non-zero, but everywhere else the basis function associated with 2 is 0 at 3, 4, 5, 6, 1 everywhere else. It is 0 at every other grid point, it is non-zero at grid point 2, but it is not just non-zero at grid point 2, it is non-zero at in a neighborhood of the grid point 2, that is why it is said to have local support. So, basis functions in the simplest possible to finite element basis functions as they are associated with the grid point, where instead of having a point support they have local support, thus they are non-zero in a neighborhood of the grid point with which they are associated, but are 0 at every other grid point. The neighborhood in which psi j is associated with node j is non-zero, the psi j is non-zero is it is a finite neighborhood and this gives rise to the idea of finite elements because the, it is 0 in a finite region. right? It is 0 in a finite region. 
let's find 0 in a phi well defined region and that is why this method is called the finite element method right first of all finite number of basis functions and these are associated with local regions in the simplest possible representations as, as i have already given this is the, this we can assume that these basis functions are linear basis functions that they are non zero at a particular grid point they are zero at every other grid, grid point and they reduce linearly to zero at the neighboring grid points so it is non zero at this grid point and it reduces linearly to zero at the neighboring grid points at zero everywhere else right at grid points which do not share a neighbor which are not neighboring grid points to grid point 2 it is identically zero or in parts of the domain which are not which do not neighbor the grid point 2 they are identically zero the linear basis functions are not really idealizations such basis functions and their extensions to two and three dimensions are commonly used in the finite element method why is this possible and we will see that it is not immediately obvious that this this very simple linear basis functions can be used to solve any useful problems but we will see that it is indeed possible and it is fact one of the attractive features of this method is that is that we can use really simple basis functions to solve that problem and why can we use these really simple basis functions to solve this problem well we'll see about that so basis the two two things which make the finite element method popular is that first of all it possesses the best approximation property since it's a galerkin method right it possesses the best approximation property we know that in that norm in that norm defined with respect to that operator right the finite the galerkin solution the finite element solution gives the best possible approximation to the true solution that we are assured right the best approximation property of the finite element method and the second thing which makes the finite element method so very popular and so widely used is the fact that these basis functions possess these very very useful properties first of all they are relatively lower order polynomials number one number two they have local support so basis function associated with a grid point is zero at every other grid point but it is not not zero it is not 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 as restrictive as the collocation method meaning that it is not a direct delta function but it is it has got local support recall that the basis function psi j belonging to h n are being used to construct basis being used to construct approximate solution u is equal to sigma j equal to 1 to n which satisfies so this is just restating the problem which satisfies the partial differential equation with linear operator l of the form l u is equal to f subject to boundary conditions right and suppose so let us look at a particular example now so suppose we are interested in solving the Laplace equation right so the Laplace equation and we are interested in solving the simplest possible Laplace equation the Laplacian operator in 1 d so interested in solving del to u del x square is equal to f in a certain domain and it is clear if you look at this equation that the solutions u to that equation must have non zero and non singular second derivatives why otherwise how are we going to solve this equation the for u if if the second derivative is singular how can you if the function u has a second derivative which is singular how on earth can it solve it, it cannot solve this equation if provided that f is a is is a reasonably well behaved function it is not possible for u to solve that equation but we just claim that we can use linear polynomial basis functions to solve this problem right we can use linear polynomial basis functions to solve this problem why is that we know that linear polynomial basis functions then there is a problem right because since it is linear we cannot assure that the second derivatives is going to be non-zero and non-singular right then how is it possible 
to use linear basis functions of the finite element method, how can we use linear basis functions in the finite element method to solve this problem? Well, the reason why we can do that is because instead of directly solving the problem L u is equal to f, which we refer to as the strong form of the equation. In the finite ele element method, we solve an equivalent weak form of the equation. How do we get the weak form? We will talk about that later. So, instead of solving this problem, we solve this problem L hat u is equal to f, where you note that the operator L hat is not the same as the operator u L. It is not the same as the operator L. And if it turns out that the, re the requirements L hat involves say first derivatives only, then it is clear that even if we use linear basis functions, it is possible to come up with a solution to that problem, because it involves less strict continuity requirements, less stringent continuity requirements, because it involves the linear operator L hat only involves first order partial derivatives. Right. So, how is that possible? Well, let us take a quick look. So, if we consider this, we are considering solutions to this in the interval x belonging to 0 to L subject to boundary conditions u is equal to 0 at x is equal to 0 and del u del x is equal to 0 at x is equal to L. So, here the boundary condition is directly on u at x is equal to 0, the boundary condition is on the partial derivative of u at x is equal to L. This type of boundary condition as we have seen earlier is a Dirichlet type of boundary condition while that is a Neumann type of boundary condition. So, using Galerk in finite elements and considering weight functions w belonging to the same function space as u, from the method of weighted residuals we have that equation. Why? We know that my L u minus f, this is basically the term within first brackets here is nothing but L u minus f that must be orthogonal to each of the basis functions w. right? If it is a pure Galerkin method, w belongs to the same space as u. If it is not, w can be basis functions which are totally different from the basis functions of the space to which space which is used to construct u. So, this is my this is the requirement right this is this is the Galerkin this is the this is the Galerkin requirement right and uh, this is basically the weighted residual requirement which becomes equal to the Galerkin Galerkin requirement if the basis functions for w are the same as u but for the timing let's think of it as a Galerkin requirement assuming that the basis functions for w are the same as the basis functions for u so then in 1d if we integrate by parts we get this right so we integrate this first term w del u del x evaluated at l and zeros make take the difference and then we have this part and this must be equal to integral of w f over 0 to l if we expand this out what do we see so we have something like this w del u del x l 0 i can write it like that w 0 del u del x 0 minus w l del u del x l i know this term is going to be automatically equal to 0 why is this term going to be automatically equal to 0 because i know that this is my boundary condition right at x is equal to l del u del x is equal to 0 that means that this term is going to be automatically equal to 0. But on top of that if I impose the restriction that my weight functions which I am calling weight functions basically these are my these are the basis functions with which with respect to which my residual has to be orthogonal right these are the basis functions with respect to which my with respect to which my residual has to be orthogonal. If I, in, I impose the condition that at the Dirichlet boundary at the Dirichlet, Dirichlet boundary the weight functions also satisfy the Dirichlet boundary condition homogeneously. 
they become 0 at x is equal to 0. So, if I choose my weight functions to satisfy that condition, if I am choosing, I am at perfect liberty to choose my weight function. Since this is a weighted residual method, right, I can do, I can choose any set of functions for my weight, for my, for my weight functions, right. And if I make them, I, if I choose them such that they become 0 on the Dirichlet boundary, then this term automatically becomes 0 as well, because w 0 is equal to 0. So, this term becomes, this term becomes 0 this term is already 0, because del u del x at l is equal to 0 from my Neumann boundary condition. So, the first term here entirely vanishes. So, this term here becomes identically equal to 0 and I am left with this equation. Now, let us look at that equation again. The integrand on the left involves only first derivatives. So, if we solve this equation rather than that equation, what is our requirement? Our requirement is that the first derivatives, the first derivatives exist in this domain, right? That these these things del w del x and del u del x does not become singular if we have to make sure that within the domain 0 to L, these derivatives do not become singular. So, if we solve this equation referred to as the weak form rather than the strong form of the equation, then it is clear that the continuity requirements have become less stringent, right. So, it is no longer necessary for the second order derivatives, the partial derivatives to exist. It is quite enough if the, if the functions u and w possess first order partial derivatives, which are non-singular in the interval 0 to L. Because, it re because these re continuity requirements have been relaxed, that is why it is possible to solve this problem L u is equal to del 2 u del x square is equal to f using piecewise linear basis functions rather than having to solve using quad if having to solve using maybe quadratic functions, right. So, you can see this is the advantage of the finite element method. First of all, it is a Galerkin method, which by virtue of it being a Galerkin method ensures that my finite element solutions give me the best possible approximation with respect to that norm, right, with respect to the norm defined in terms of the operator L, number 1. Number 2, it allows these very, very, very useful, very, very simple basis function with less continuity requirements to be used, right, which does not require very high order. It we can one can solve complicated problems, higher order partial differential equations with comparatively lower order polynomial basis functions. And these basis functions possess local support, which also makes them attractive, right. We can associate each basis function if we are solving a real problem in, in, in a physical problem we can associate each basis function with a small part of the domain, right. It is not possible to integrate each integrate these uh, carry out these integrals over huge hu huge areas, right, because I know that these basis functions are 0 everywhere in z are, are, are non 0 in a only only locally, right, and th they have local support these basis functions have local support. So, they are non 0 locally. So, my finite elements can be I can I can carry out my integrations over small parts of my domain, right? So my my elements become truly finite, right? They can I can make them as small as possible, depending on how close I I, I I divide I divide my how how closely I place my grid points. I can make my domains as small as possible, and then my domain of integration becomes small. if necessary, if I know that in a certain part of the problem, I am not interested or there, there or I am interested in, a, in, in a, a, a certain part of the problem, I am truly, in, there are sharp gradients, the solution varies a lot. I can make those regions with, I can define very small grid, I can define very closely spaced grid points in those regions and then I can get more accurate solutions in those regions, while in regions where the solution is not of much interest, I can mesh it, 
I can replace my grid points in as coarse a manner as possible and get some sort of approximate solution, but I am not really interested in that. I am interested in the part where the solution shows sharp gradients as has large variations. Right? So, it gives a lot of freedom. Basically, it allows use of lower order polynomials. It assures the use assures that it is the best possible solution in that space and it gives a lot so it gives overall it gives a lot of freedom it is applicable to a very wide range of problems because and that's why it is so very attractive so this allows hn to be chosen as a space of linear functions as i just said with local support and enables finding the solution of Laplace's equations with basis functions which are low order linear polynomials. Similar conversions from strong to weak form for other partial differential equations for example, the diffusion equation or the wave equation exist and enable the finite element form of the weighted residual method to be used for a very wide variety of applications and solid and fluid mechanics. But it is important to understand that the reason why the finite element method works is because it is a Galerkin method most importantly and why the Galerkin method is so very good is because it has this best approximation property right. It has this best approximation property and moreover for, for, a, for a particular class of problems for instance for self adjoint linear operators for self adjoint operators the Galerkin method and the variational method are identical. So, if you can solve a problem using a variational method, you can you are guaranteed that you can solve it using the Galerkin method. Basically, you can solve it since you can solve it using a Galerkin method, you can solve it using the finite element method. So, we will end our lecture here. Next class, we are going to start talking about integral operators. Thank you.